In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I trashed my first uh, homily attempt after reading this uh, gospel lesson. Uh, I originally thought I was going to preach about who do you dance for, because we have the Old Testament lesson, the gospel lesson. Old Testament lesson, David dances for the king of glory. And then we have the gospel lesson where a young lady dances for the king of Galilee. One is joyous, brings light. The other is sinister and dark. Um, but I decided not to do that um, because I don't know much about dancing. Um, I, I do know this, that I'm more uncomfortable attempting to dance than talking about it. Because when I dance, I tend to resemble Elaine Bennett's uh, from Seinfeld, the kick turn. So I'll put that aside. But reading that gospel lesson, you may, as you read that gospel lesson, have the same kind of uh, reaction that I do when you read it. That is, this is the gospel. Gospel means good news. Here is the good news that we just heard. Well, I tell you, this good, good news... Uh, is served with a heaping side dish of yikes because this story when you when you read it it sounds more like an episode of game of thrones right uh, but the bible we know does not shy away from the messy things of life the messy parts of life that's why it's still around after all these centuries because it still speaks to all aspects of living the elements of the story and are as old as time. I don't have to tell you that. It's a story that, that newspapers and documentaries can't get enough of telling you. The story of how a person who's acquired fame and fortune through unchecked power and lust and greed and pride and violence can seem unstoppable. And even the subject of maybe just a little envy. But in the end, it always comes tumbling down. Call it karma, call it destiny, call it God's will. It seems to be true that time and time again, evil will eventually be defeated. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. says, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. In the story of King Herod and of the beheading of John the Baptizer, we see a powerful leader who is gripped by fear and insecurity, ultimately succumbing to dark corners in his heart. Herod may have been a cunning politician, but he was also a person consumed by fear. He saw his position. He was in a precarious situation. He was a ruler who was pop, propped up by the Roman authorities. And outside there's a whisper of a Messiah about a new king that's going to take over. And then there's John the baptizer threatening his power, a fiery preacher that is, is calling for him as king to repent. All of these must have stirred up great anxiety in this king. He couldn't tolerate dissent, especially when it came from such a charismatic figure who was growing in popularity like John. John who was condemning him in his marriage because his marriage was a scandal and it was against Jewish law. So Herod was caught between pleasing his Roman overlords and pleasing the Jewish people who, who resented any outward support from him towards a foreign power which was occupying their land. So John became haunted. And this kind of reminds me of the Dickens tale about ghosts haunting someone. I mean, he's, he's haunted by this figure of John the baptizer. A constant reminder of his propped up power. So Herod's temper and his need to save face, fueled by this poisonous whispers which are coming from his wife sealed John the Baptizer's fate. Unchecked emotions, haunting consequences of poor choices. Like Herod, we all face those shadows sometimes. We 
We have whispers in our ears, urging us onward sometimes to making really bad decisions. But instead of seeking guidance or repenting, for want of a better word, Herod makes a tragic decision after he'd already imprisoned John, a decision fueled by this warped sense of self-preservation. And then there's that pivotal moment. Herod, captivated by his stepdaughter's dance, makes a foolish vow to grant her any request up to half my kingdom. It's a promise that he made impulsively, fueled by momentary pleasure, a desire to impress his guests. Little did he know that that unthinking vow would set a course of destruction. Herod's story isn't just about a murderous king. It's a, it's a cautionary tale because we see how fear and insecurity left unchecked can lead to terrible decisions. So Herod's sin, influenced by pride and paranoia, created a stain on his legacy. Because history tells us that a couple of years after this, in the year 39, his own family turns on him and accuses him of conspiracy against the Roman emperor Caligula. Talk about another party animal, Caligula. Uh, and then so Caligula sends him into exile in Gaul. And there he died, stripped of all his power, his wealth. He died on a forgotten date. He's buried in a forgotten place. Yet John the baptizer down through the centuries, although he was silenced then, becomes a martyr and he serves as a reminder about what awaits those who think that they are above law, especially God's law. Truth always prevails. We have all internal battles. Every one of us, we have fears, we have insecurities. Um, they can take root in us and grow. But the good news is that unlike Herod, we can choose differently. When anxieties and doubts creep in, we can turn to God's grace and not double down on what we have or what we think we have, and that is power to control everything. Prayer, reflection, Seeking the solace and the counsel of the church community are all weapons that we have that we can use to confront those evil, sinful desires and make better choices. Those things, same things, prayer, reflection, and the holy community were available to King Herod if he'd only, if he'd only looked beyond his own grandiose personality to find those. Every minute of every day, forgiveness is available from a merciful God. In our gospel lesson, there are several points, as you read, that King Herod could have stopped and asked for forgiveness for his ill will towards John the baptizer. I mean, he could have repented and released him from prison. He could have repented and spared his life by repenting of the sin of agreeing to doing his execution, but his pride would not allow him. He felt his pride, his strength, and his power was in danger by seeking repentance. And I, I suggest that he looked at repentance wrong, and sometimes we do as well. We believe that repentance have to be some type of torturous experience, a painful experience, like beating ourselves with a whip. But I found a, a quote from an early church uh, father from the Greek Orthodox tradition, and I wish I could give credit, um, but it has allowed me to look at repentance with new eyes and a new hope, and I share that with you now. The quote is this, to repent is not to look downwards at my own shortcomings, but upwards at God's love. It is not to look backwards with self-reproach, but to look forward with trustfulness. It is not to see what I have failed to be, but what by the grace of Christ 
I might become. I want to say that again. When you repent, it's not to look down on your shortcomings, but to look up to God's love. It's not to look backwards with self-reproach, but to look forward with trust. And it's not to see, I have failed to become this, but rather, this is what I can become with the grace of Christ. May we learn from Herod's tragic tale. May we confront our own shadows and ghosts with courage and faith. May we ask God through his love to forgive us and to comfort us and to strengthen us. May we seek the light of God and the strength of community to guide us on a path of righteousness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.